Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, a midterm legislative update. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Beth Ann Kozlovich from Hawaii Public Radio sitting in tonight. We're about halfway through the legislative session and lawmakers have just decided which bills they'll send from the House to the Senate and vice versa. The transition is known as crossover and this year measures that survived include bills that uh, help the homeless find shelter and other types of support. Other surviving bills call for an increase in the fuel tax to benefit operations of the State Department of Transportation, and still other legislation would impose a new tax on vacation rentals. So what does all of this mean at the midpoint of the legislative session for you and your wallet? We'd like to hear from you during tonight's show, so call us with your questions and comments at 973-1000 if you're on Oahu or 800-238-4847 if you're on a neighbor island. You can also watch Insight stream live at pbshawaii.org. Just click on the title of tonight's show or find us on Twitter at PBS Hawaii. Now to our guests. Senator Will Espero is Vice President of the Hawaii State Senate and Vice Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs. Senator Espero also sits on the committee that oversees bills related to commerce, consumer protection and health. He represents the West Oahu District that includes Eva Beach. Representative Marcus Oshiro is the former chair of the House Finance Committee and since 1994 has represented the central Oahu district that includes Wahiwa and Whitmore Village. Representative Oshiro previously served in several leadership posts, including majority leader. In 2012, he was endorsed by then Speaker Calvin Say to succeed him as Speaker of the House, but the post went instead to another faction led by Representative Joe Suki. Also joining us is Tom Yamachika, the president and of Tax Foundation of Hawaii, a private nonprofit organization dedicated to informing taxpayers about the finances of our state and local governments. Tom is also a tax attorney in private practice. We'd like you to know that members of the House Majority Leadership Team, including Speaker Joe Suki, declined to appear. And now let's get started. Here we are, we're at the midpoint of this session. And as sessions begin to take on a character, usually by this point, I'm curious what each of you sees as you look out at the session. And I'll start with you, Marcus Oshiro. Well, at the half halfway point right now, I think uh, we're focusing upon the most important issues of the day, and that's homelessness. And I think that's one of the key issues that's going to define whether this is a successful or unsuccessful session, how we deal with homelessness. I think that's one of the most important issues of the day we're wrestling with right now. And it's primarily a budget-driven issue. How much money do we allocate to the homeless services? How much money do we allocate to build a residential um, structures for them? How much money do we put into a public housing fund to refurbish and restore the units to house these homeless individuals? So I think that's one of the most important issues today. And I'll have to uh, agree with uh, the representative. Uh, the Senate passed over to the House um, over half a dozen bills that deal with um, homelessness, um, whether it's um, services for the homeless or funding the revolving fund or the Hawaii uh, Housing um, Authority. Um, certainly, this is the top issue for the majority of the legislators and even the public. Um, this issue is impacting and affecting every community, every island, and certainly um, we need to um, put our put the money where our mouth is and we need to provide some results. Um, I don't see too much in terms of a lot of um, tax increases this session, especially since in an election year, although the state did pass over the gas tax, the, the weight tax and the registration tax, but it was very contentious during our um, third reading on that bill with eight senators, including myself, voting against that measure. I'm almost surprised to hear you not include in your list anything having to do with uh, police reform and OCCC, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yes. I want to get to Tom Yamachika. 
As you look at this session and having just watched an almost $14 billion budget being passed over from the House to the Senate, what do you think about this session as we have now come to the midpoint? Well, we're, we're still really just kind of holding our breath to see what, uh, you know, what comes through and what kind of threats uh, you know, face taxpayers' wallets. Now, all of, all of these things that you know, Representative Oshiro and, and, and Senator Sparrow talked about are, um, are valuable, but they do cost money. The money has to come from somewhere. And, uh, and it won't be just their pockets, it'll be all of us. So what we try to do is we try to be vigilant, we try to watch what's happening and um, uh, make sure that taxpayers stay informed about you know, what the legislature is, is doing or, or um, is proposing to do so they can you know, be informed and let their, uh, you know, their, their politicians, the people who represent them, uh, know what's going on and know their feelings on, the, on these issues. As you brought up homelessness first, and certainly that was uh, the top or near the top of the list for many people, as we went into this session, watching some of these bills morph and change and looking at you know, one of them in particular that says, well, our goal should be to create 22,500 units. But this idea of defining a goal and having it amount to, well, let's study it some more. That seems to be rankling people. It, it should. I think it's the, the, the evidence is already there. It's self-evident that we have a crisis. We need to, we're short 22, 25,000 homes. We need to build at least 2,500 over the next 10 years. So there's no need to study it any further. The question right now is that we have the will and desire to fund the current housing programs. You know, the rental housing revolving fund. Uh, I think the governor asked for 75 million. We gave him 25 million. He asked uh, us to give him 31 million, or 31 million or so for the public housing uh, renovation. Um, we gave him three or four million dollars. Um, he asked for us to lift the, uh, the cap on the conveyance fee that goes to build affordable housing. We didn't even hear that measure, consider that measure. And these are sources of money, Bethann, that the private sector is asking us to make available so they can get in there, leverage the public monies, and build these housing units for people. These are permanent units for people, and that's going to help address the crisis we're facing today, being number one in the country, embarrassingly, for homelessness. Well, Esparo, you're on the other side on the Senate. As you just heard what Representative Oshiro had to say, how do you look at some of these measures where they look to be, you know, maybe there was going to be some money there, but certainly nothing what the governor had asked for. Well, each year, you know, we have to look at the, the total budget from what the uh, governor requests to what will be Senate priorities, House priorities, and then the bills that are introduced by all of our members. And, and it's, it's quite a task to, to come up with a a plan that everybody likes because at the end of the day our revenue stream is only this big but the desires and the demands and wants of our constituents are this big and so you know we're at the point now where we're we're trying to provide a little more focus on on the key areas that we can all agree upon and then make that decision on, on how much we can we can provide. The Senate now is looking at the House budget, and there will certainly be changes. I know that um, schools, for example, uh, was a big item for the governor with his um, plan to provide um, AC for a, a thousand classrooms. That would impact my district significantly. Uh, it doesn't look like he's going to get the full 100 million, but that's still an area that we're. We're trying to see um, what we can compromise and come up with, but certainly um, it's not easy when you look at the total, total budget statewide and what everyone is requesting. We're already getting some questions in, and some of them I'm sure are going to be directed directly at you, Tom. This one in particular, looking at uh, Senate Bill 2938 would increase auto registration, weight, and the gas tax. Why would the legislature do this when the Department of Transportation has hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of unspent federal funds. The idea of spending money wisely and well and being assured that wherever the money that's collected from taxpayers will go will be spent well seems to be what's behind 
all of this. I want to talk to you a little bit about that fuel tax, though. I mean, here sure. we are in an election year, and people have gotten really used to going to the pump and not feeling such a sting. And then along comes this bill. Well, um, there, there's, there's kind of a couple things going on here. One is that there's part of the fuel tax law that kind of died at the end of 2015 uh, because it was part of a 2012 law um, that said at the end of 2015 it's going to revert back to what it was in 2000, uh, well, before that particular law was enacted. And, and the effect of it was it dropped the gas tax down one cent. It dropped the aviation fuel tax down one cent. It dropped diesel down one cent. Uh, and it did another, um, a number of other things uh, that I guess Department of Transportation didn't know was going to happen. So, uh, so, so now they're going, oh my God, we had this money we, were thought, we thought was coming to us and it is, and is now going down the tubies. So, um, and, and it also doesn't help that the price of gasoline kind of shot down. Uh, so, so any, um, uh, uh, well, I mean, our, our uh, fuel tax is based on, on gallonage rather than, than value, but uh, it certainly skewed the demand kind of, kind of a bit. Now, in terms of um, how uh, the department spends its money, uh, I, I know Senator Takuda uh, this past summer, uh, had hearings calling a number of departments to task for, okay, you have all these federal grants, uh, are you spending them down? And for in, in, in most instances, the answer was no, and they were getting in trouble with the feds for having all of this money that was granted to them, they weren't spending it, and the feds were starting to say, geez, if you can't spend this money that we're giving you, why should we give you any more? And um, and I think you're the you know the caller who just just gave you that question is is kind of thinking the same for uh, you know this particular uh, for this particular tax measure. Okay, uh, one of the uh, departments that was on the hit list or the hot list for this past summer was Department of Transportation because they have what's called a federal backlog of about uh, I think it's down to six hundred million dollars. Yes. Um, which is which is basically when when they start a federal project, uh, all these federal monies get encumbered, uh, but they, but they, of course they can't spend them all at once. So so there's a normal and expected level of a backlog that, that you're expecting for a, a department of our size, and and the, and the feds have told us it's about 450 million dollars. Okay, there's still a, quite a bit of difference between 450 million, which is where the feds think we should be, and where we are, which is like six uh, 600, I believe. So um, the question then becomes, well, why, why can't we spend the money down? Uh, you know, there are delays, and maybe you can answer that. And let me interject. Um, with these federal funds, uh, usually there's a certain amount that the state needs to match as well. So it's not like we have $600 million that we could spend any way we want. Um, the, it's, sometimes it's like an 80 federal, 20 um, state. And then you're talking about not only um, roads and freeways, but when you're talking transportation, for example, you're talking harbors, airports, and freeways. So, um, for example, the North-South Road, when it was built in Kapolei, that cost $155 million. So, depending on the size of a project, um, that money could be spent down quickly. But in the Senate, the vote on that bill was 10 were yes, Six were with reservations, which means they weren't too sure, but they'll pass it at this point in time, and eight of us said no. And one reason why we felt that um, this was not necessary at this time was because um, DOT does some good work, but they've also been criticized for, for being inefficient. Um, uh, for example, uh, recently when Governor Ige came on board, uh, there was a $14 million contract that he canceled with the Department of Transportation. It was a financial accounting contract because of the, the, just the fact that it was going nowhere and it was a waste of money. And then I can recall um, five or six years ago, we had a groundbreaking for a PM zipper lane that would assist and help Central Oahu and West Oahu, mm -hmm. and millions of dollars were spent on that. Mm -hmm. And then 
a couple years later, they canceled that. So there's been cases of inefficiencies and even a national report that said the state per highway mile is spending $90,000 in admin costs compared to other parts of the nation that are spending 10000 or less. And, and Kentucky, thus, for example. Yes. 1000 or less. Well, which is still 10000 or less. <laughs> and Considerably well, less. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, think it's, I think it's going to challenge, you know, fundamentally, rule of thumb, uh, we don't want to raise taxes in an election year. Um, it doesn't help your re-election. Uh, number, uh, number two, I think people need to understand the reason why one would even propose that. Th these, are the, these are the funding sources to match the federal dollars requiring the federal drawdown. We need to have the state match. These are for highways. Uh, these are for freeways. These are for byways. All the improvements that people request and we get calls from uh, repeatedly day in, day out. And it comes out to about $84 uh, uh, a car a year. So break it down, 12 months is about uh, $7, $7 a month, um, three, $3.50, about $0.25 cents a day if you spread it out over an entire year. That's the additional cost per vehicle. And given the price of gasoline today, where it is right now, record low, I think the lowest has been in several years now, I can understand why the governor proposed this. There's also the um, factor that Congress recently passed some highway expenditure bill that's good for five years. And so the governor wants to make sure we have access to all five years of drawing down that money. But again, at the end of the day, for all these good reasons, I don't think we'll be able to muster uh, the votes to get it out. Very, very challenging in election year, unless you can make the case that the monies will be spent appropriately, will cut the overhead, you know, and we can uh, deal with the backlog of federal funds. But it's, 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 a, it's a tough, tough go at it right now. All right, yeah. we're going to leave that one for the moment. And thanks very much to Sam from Kalihi for the call. Lots of questions here for you. Someone says, love the show. Nice to know. The rapid growth of illegal vacation rentals has devastated our coastal communities, pushing out local families from areas they grew up in. Spectators are moving in, speculators are moving in, working people can no longer afford to rent. There are now more illegal vacation rentals in rural Ko'olaloa and other areas with such horrible housing crises as we're facing now. Why is this bill being put forth? And we have another question asking about the Airbnb bill as well, which would allow them to be the agent to collect those funds. So a lot of people are very concerned about the issue of transit real quick I, I have concerns with that bill and I think the idea is um, the intention is, 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 is to generate the revenues that's being lost by these illegal rentals the concern that many people have is you're going to sanction and condone these illegal rentals that shouldn't shouldn't be operating in the first place by allowing this um, private uh, payer or collector of taxes uh, to have a role in collecting the taxes that we may not be getting right now and that might provide the legal and or screen for those illegal vac vacation rentals. And that's kind of the, the dynamic going back and forth right now. Well, let me, let me kind of provide yeah. the counterpoint to that, which is, you know, what we're really talking about is just an alternative collection mechanism. Like, for example, if, uh, you know, the, s the senator here goes to work, right, he gets paid by the state, but he doesn't get all of it directly, he gets part of it withheld, right? Because his employer withholds tax because the employer has the money, can pay it over to the state in, in a much more efficient fashion than just, just paying it to Willie and, and, uh, and hoping that he'll pay the state. Now, um, at, at some point, you, you have to look at a withholding mechanism. You, you realize it's more, it's more efficient, right? That, that's, why, uh, that, that's why we all have withholding, right, if you're an employee. Uh, there are several kinds of withholding, uh, including there's a, a, a scheme for multi-level marketing, which is already in law. Uh, and that's what's being proposed here. Now, now the issue then becomes, all right, are you going to use this withholding mechanism to, quote, sanction illegal behavior? So, so it's, it's like somebody co going to an employer and saying, geez, um, shall I be asking all of my employees, are, are you current on your credit cards? Are you current on your mortgage? And if, and if not, shouldn't I be paying you know, the mortgage company, the credit card company? If, if, I, if I just pay the employee directly, am I sanctioning illegal behavior? At some point, you got to say, look, 
you know, you, you, these employees, the people who, you, who you're paying the money to, they're adults, right? They're, they're business people. They, they have responsibility for what they're doing. That's, that's where the responsibility lies. And then the, and the, uh, the, the part about collecting the money is just an, an, uh, uh, a mechanism to, to collect and, and pay it to the state more efficiently. Actually, um, we heard that bill, the House bill today, in um, consumer protection and housing. And, and exactly, um, for those that aren't familiar with this, it would allow these um, brokers to collect the money from people that are renting the um, rent, um, transient rental units and the bed and breakfast. The agents, so someone like Airbnb or Exactly. Others. So uh, they would be able to collect the, the TAT tax, the general excise tax, and from that perspective, it's a good idea. But as the rep said, and what we were discussing today in committee is, is there a way that we can um, have the broker um, check on whether the, the unit that's being rented out is legal or illegal. And if it's illegal, basically they wouldn't be able to, to participate within that program. And, so you're you know, asking them not only to be collecting the fees, but also having to be that gatekeeper for whether it's illegal or illegal. Right, because for instance, they have to put an address up, but why couldn't they um, next to that address put their, their tax um, number of verification um, to show that yes, we are legal. So, so that's the discussion right now we're having with these brokers and, and that will probably help decide whether the bill moves forward or, or not. We started a little while ago to talk about homelessness and that touched off a number of calls from people. And a lot of calls um, seemingly have very similar sentiments. This one, I read where it takes $40,000 to support houselessness. Why don't we have a job fair to get them jobs to support themselves? Dennis from Honolulu said, well, how many of Hawaii's working poor are driven into homelessness while the state spends millions of dollars on the already homeless people? And please tell me why the state has to fund homeless people that come from the mainland. I mean, you hear a lot of these same things. Some of them are more, maybe more, more myth than, than based in reality. But the level of understanding about homelessness seems to be one of the battles that collectively we've been fighting or, or hearing about coming through the legislature as well as just general conversations about social services and those people who are providing them. How do you answer some of these questions to people who see clearly that there are homeless people in our communities but really don't understand some of the ways in which they weave into the health and well-being of them? Well, Thank you. I think, first of all, uh, there is an urban myth or urban legend out there that we have thousands of folks from the mainland uh, flying over here uh, uh, from, their, from the respective states of the mainland. Uh, the facts are actually uh, a majority of the people who are homeless are local residents, people who are born and raised here, who have families here, who went to school here. Uh, that's the majority of people. Uh, another fact that needs to be pointed out, a majority of them also have some source of income either to some part-time job, some employment, um, but they can't afford uh, to pay rental housing or other, other type of housing. Um, another, another fact that needs to point out, many of these individuals, maybe half of them are what we call uh, recently uh, homeless. These are the ones that, because of a loss of job, catastrophic illness, um, something going on in, the, in their household, have lost their housing. So we can get those guys back into uh, rental housing or some kind of permanent housing. But that's, that's half of them. That's what a rapid rehousing is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rapid rehousing, giving them the first month's rent, helping them over the next three, four, five uh, months' rent. We can do that, giving them the social services, the mental health services, the drug plan, the, the food stamps, etc. But there's also those out there who have severe mental challenges, the mentally disabled. And I think that's where we need to put more effort and time and money into it. You know, there's this guy named Floyd, Lloyd Pendleton right now. I think he's visiting with the mayor right now. He is the guru. He is the rock star of the best practices called Housing First. And what they've learned in Salt Lake and these other cities is that if you provide shelter for even those who are not clean, dry, or sober, provide them shelter, then other things will, will be brought to them in the mental health care, the job training, the GED, you know, the domestic violence kind of situations. But you need to start with housing. 
which is what they did in Utah, where they took about 20 people who were, as Lloyd Pendleton once said, just the worst of the worst, and they put them into housing. And a year later, they still had most of them there, maybe just a few who had dropped out. Exactly. They've had an extremely uh, successful rate, not having the recidivism that you might otherwise think. It's counterintuitive, Beth Ann, but it works. It's good on policy, saving us money. It's smart spending, best policies, and it's success. So I think that's where we're going right now to answer some of the concerns that have been raised. And we, at the end of the day, we need to provide more affordable housing. Uh, the sad thing is that housing is very expensive in Hawaii, especially when you compare it to the mainland. And um, the fact that many and a large majority of our homeless are underemployed is an issue that we need to help in terms of, you know, rental vouchers and, you know, helping them find full-time permanent positions um, for all members of their family. But if we don't provide um, and aren't creative um, working with the private sector and nonprofits to ultimately build some low-cost affordable housing and rental, we're never going to fix this problem. Um, and I don't see this problem getting fixed for a minimum of five years at the, at the very least. But we need to work together and many of us are hoping with uh, the rail system and transit oriented development, uh, we'll be able to build high density communities around these rail stations, uh, these micro units that they're looking at in Kaka'ako for example, and, and look at other ways to provide housing that our residents can afford. One of the things that we, we may want to think about is um, that right now the way our, our tax system is set up, and, and this is you know, very, very different from how it is in any other state, uh, we tax rent. So uh, our general excise tax applies, uh, applies to rent, so somebody who is renting out a unit um, for $100 has to pay $4.50 into, uh, into our state general fund. Now, uh, the, the question is, as a policy matter, is it appropriate uh, you know, across the entire spectrum? I mean, you would think that it would be appropriate for maybe you know, higher end rentals, but what about the lower one? I think the legislature is trying to address that right now. Uh, several years ago, we passed out a low income renters tax credit. It was, it was good for two years. I think it provided about $7 million in relief to the low income renters uh, out there. There's a bill right now, I think in the Senate right now, Willie, that would actually tie that um, to the CPI over several years. And I think that's, that's part of the solution to offset the GET being applied for that certain class of low income renters out there. So we're trying to address that, Tom. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 in, the interesting thing, though, is, is that you know, when, you, when, you give you, when you give people that credit through the tax system, um, you're, you're making them file a very, very complicated document. Uh, not everybody does that. So in some senses, that puts a barrier in front of them where they could have access to it, but perhaps they don't know they can, or they simply don't file the paperwork. Now, in all the discussion that we've had, talking about the various populations within those who are homeless, nobody mentioned veterans. As of the end of last year, we were getting very near functional zero for veterans. That would still apply to us where we are now, but bringing up the issue of how much GET someone who is at that low end, including a veteran, would have to pay makes that seem uh, a little bit more difficult to be get somebody housed. Well, obviously, veterans are important, but what we have to look at everybody, um, whether you're a veteran or not a veteran, whether you're a single parent or an elderly individual or someone with mental health problems or a drug addiction, uh, we need to look at all of the community, and there are certainly um, others out there in nonprofits helping our veterans, and, and they are, there are several bills actually helping veterans in other ways, but um, certainly that is an area that's being looked at. All right, tonight we're talking about bills that survived the legislative crossover. We'd like to hear from you, so call, email, or tweet your questions and comments. You can call us at 973-1000 or 800-238-4847 if you're calling from a neighbor island. We want you to know that members of the House Majority Leadership Team, including Speaker Joe Suki, declined to appear. Now we're going to get back to it. As you see, we've got lots and lots of calls and uh, questions coming in, a lot of them about how about housing and about homelessness. This one specifically going back to housing, saying that on the windward side because of illegal vacation rentals, 
taxes are not being collected, a constant stream of strangers in your neighborhood adding to homelessness because of a shortage of rentals for a fair rental price. These are some of the reasons why I don't approve of the growing amount of rentals forced upon our community every year. Susan Yamada sent that in. How would you answer her? Well, first of all, the uh, regulation of illegal uh, illegal is, is with the city and county. That's, that's, that's their kuleana right now as far as the political entity. It should be the city and county enforcing that. And this, this means of taxing it is, is what we're trying to bring as a solution for the TAT and the GET that we're not collecting right now. But as far as enforcement of what's appropriate in that particular district or area, and it's not only her district, it's on the North Shore also. That's also a problem there. But it's primarily with the city and county. Yeah, zoning issues are, yeah. are, are exclusively uh, county level, so. But this brings up a point, though, because every time we have an issue that comes up, everyone sort of runs to someone they feel is going to listen to their case about it. Do we expect too much from state government? Do we expect too much from city government? I don't think so. Um, what's unique about Hawaii is we're the, the largest population of 1.4 million. Um, that's the furthest from any other landmass. And, and we're in a very unique situation in that our population is just continually growing. In the next 50 years, I project there could be another 500,000 people living on Oahu. And as our population growing, though, our, our land is finite. That's not changing. So um, sadly, it looks like the cost of living is going to continue to grow. And we might turn into a state of have and have nots if we don't address some of these major policy issues today in terms of land use, in terms of growth and development, housing issues, agriculture. They're all tied in transportation to our growing population. And we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions um, at the city level as well as the state level um, because that's what our job is in government. And we don't always please everybody uh, because, you know, one issue can have three or four points of views. And, and that's where it's difficult that we try to um, come up with what is best for everyone. Yeah, well, let me, let me uh, I guess, challenge one of the uh, premises behind that. And, and, and that is I've, I've recently seen a study that, that says over the past seven years, you know, from, from the economic crash, uh, you know, to present, uh, we, we've on average lost 2% uh, of our population a year. So they, they're, 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 you know, starting here, they're going to other states, okay? Um, and this is uh, something that perhaps you would expect when you, when you have a high-tax system, you know, people start voting with their feet. And, and that's... Now, actually, though, every 10 years, our population has increased. Um, there, there are dips, and we do have a lot of residents leaving, but we have a lot of immigrants coming here as well, whether they're from the mainland, Canada, or Asia. And, and population-wise, every 10 years, it's increased anywhere from, if I'm right, 11 to 17,000 every 10 years. Which says that we're going to have a little bit more concern about how we use the land that we do. And already we've seen agriculture being a put front and center in all of that with a lot of the controversy that we've had in areas where we're taking ag land to turn it into housing in some cases or just looking at the issue of how we're going to be able to feed ourselves a little better. Obviously, we're never going to be able to do it uh, even 50 percent perhaps, but to do something to move the needle. We have a lot of calls asking us about when are we going to see support for agriculture? It's slowly disappearing, and that's sad. That's Dean from Honoka asking that. Dan from Hilo said, with agriculture disappearing in Hawaii, is it not a waste to continue funding the Department of Agriculture? And, and others who are asking the question about, really, how do we create a, a streamlined and integrated plan for keeping ag in Hawaii? You know, one of the biggest issues we're facing right now, it's somewhat controversial, is uh, what's going to happen with HCNS? You know, they're going to be taking about 37, 36,000 acres out of uh, sugar cultivation. This is A and B, Alexander and Baldwin property on the island of Maui. Uh, the question there is what's going to happen to those 675 employees over the next year or so? And what's going to happen to the water from the East uh, Maui irrigation system that's currently uh, going to those lands that could be repurposed for diversified agriculture? So that's one of the biggest issues facing us right now. 
Uh, it's, highly, it's highly controversial because you have a court ruling that declared uh, uh, four uh, water permits to be um, in violation of the law. Uh, they're, they're, they're not temporary, they're almost like a license, you know, after you go for 10 to 12 years. But there's also the issue of what happens in the meanwhile uh, until the Department of Land and Natural Resources Water Commission figures out some kind of forum and procedure to properly assess and address the needs and uses and other uses of this water. What do you just do? Shut it off? Shut the, shut the, shut the tap off? What happens to all these lands out there? That's been cultivated for 140 years. But at the same time, you want to recognize the, the rights under the Constitution of, of water being a public resource. Uh, public trust. Public trust, exactly. So you have the taro farmers. You have the, the, the native Hawaiians interested in restoring uh, their streams and, and floodplains and estuaries. And they're all legitimate, valid reasons. And we're hoping that the parties can, can, can come together and find some kind of understanding and common ground, because there's a lot there. We all want to be uh, food security, safe. We want to be able to grow our own food. Our well, own some of our own food. I mean, every time yeah. we talk about growing yeah. our own food, yeah. Yeah. we have to remember that yeah. we only have a certain amount of land and we're not going to be able to feed all of ourselves, you know, all of, all of us. Uh, it, it, but we, if, we can do, if we can do 10, 15 percent um, uh, locally, uh, if we can do that, uh, that's, that's a material difference of what we're currently exporting out of our state. And yeah. over the years, we, we have been supportive of agriculture. Um, in, in the Wahewa region in central Oahu, we've looked at purchasing some of the, the private agriculture lands and make them public lands that we could lease out to our farmers. Uh, we've looked at um, low interest loans. We've looked at supporting infrastructure like irrigation systems, especially on the neighbor island. Uh, one of the major problems, however, is that our youth do not want to be farmers. You know, everything's technology and, and other well, areas. Maybe but, not. No, but We've talked to some who are very clearly looking at that and some, farmers who are trying to bring them in. Some, Even Richard Haas yeah. saying with his farm, he'd love to see some new young yeah. farmers but come in and trying to do that. But not enough are looking at agriculture as a, as a career. Farming the land is tough and difficult. And, and um, you know, if we can provide incentives for our young um, people and our um, youth to get involved, that could help as well. But organic farming, though, is doing really well in, in Hawaii. And I know that um, Larry Jeffs, you know, he has 3,000 acres on Oahu, and he, he sells out. Um, he doesn't have a problem. So it can be profitable, but it takes a certain individual. And, and one area we're looking at um, a, a new product for us is, is hemp, for example. Uh, and that's something that and we're... Is still alive. Yes, it is. And, and um, that's something that we we're hoping that can be a benefit to us because of literally thousands of uses that hemp can provide. Yeah, so I think it's just part of a broader discussion of, okay, here you have Hawaii, we have you know, a limited amount of land, a limited amount of natural resources. Um, what do you put in, uh, in our economic engine to make it run? Okay, right now the only thing that's, that's providing any significant output is tourism. And the question becomes, you know, do, do we want to try to um, stimulate agriculture? Do we want to do manufacturing, uh, which is kind of what was, you know, being pushed last year? Uh, do, you want to, do, you want to, do you want to, you know, really big, uh, put a big push on high technology? Do you want to let the market decide? What do you want to do? So that's uh, very, very good questions. Speaking of questions, we have many more coming in, and thank you very much for giving those to us. Asking you to please comment on the idea of homeowners renting to people who are homeless for a tax break. What are the pros and cons of this proposal? I don't believe there's a bill considering that, but that's something we can consider. Would you see anything from a tax perspective where this would be a good or not such a good idea, Tom? Um. I would have to kind of look at it further, but... We'd have to actually have a proposal to be talking about specifically. Yeah. Okay, we're going to leave that one going. Um, in your or from your perspective, do you see the distinctions between owner-occupied rentals and investor-buyer rentals because of the disparity uh, is unequal or unfair? We've talked about this before in terms of people who have second homes here. Should there be a different tax structure for that? How do you assess that differently, perhaps? But that's, I think, what's driving some of this question. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now that's, that's um, you have to realize a county issue because 
uh, you know, we, we don't own the property. I mean, the state does not own the property tax anymore. It used to, okay. But, but, but now that decision is, is driven back down to the counties and, and has been since, since I think the early 1980s. Um, so, so what the city and county of Honolulu did was they, they created this, this secondary property classification called Residential A, which, which was like 70% higher in terms of tax rate. And, and it was triggered when you, you had a property that's assessed at over a million dollars and is not uh, qualifying for the owner, um, the uh, homeowner exemption, okay? And, and, th th and there have been like growing pains with that because uh, you, know, you know, certain issues have come up over the, the first, I guess, couple of years that that's happened, and uh, people were doing all kinds of hand wringing trying to, you know, straighten those issues out. Yes. But that's 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 one way of dealing with it. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna move on in the interest of time because here's a question that I think is is really very much in your bailiwick. What's the status of negotiations for the state to buy a federal prison? Right now. I'm not aware that the federal government wants to sell that prison for starters uh, because they, they need a federal facility. Uh, so it's really not a, a high priority, at least not at the legislature. If anyone were to initiate those talks, uh, it should be the governor and, and maybe reaching out to our congressional delegation. Uh, but um, uh, that's nothing that we're necessarily dealing with right now with the legislature. But we have been talking about OCCC. Yes. And what about money for that, which doesn't look like it's going to come through this year? Right. The, that was a priority for the governor, to move OCCC, make it more modern, make it more efficient, and take it from Kalihi. And, and he was looking at the, the governor looking at the Halava, uh, where our prison is now. And the cost of that prison was in excess of $400 million. Um, the governor came in with a proposal that would have... Um, exempted the state from um, an, an EA or EIS, and, and that got shot down rather quickly. Um, but if I understand correctly, I think the House wanted the governor to relook at the Kalihi site and see if they could make a, a facility, a jail in particular, um, on a smaller footprint. Uh, so honestly, right now, I'm not too sure where that discussion is going to go. We still have to take up the House measure in the Senate, but certainly it's a priority. Um, but um, we need to have the um, same thinking between the House, the Senate, and the governor, and, and we're not yet there. And what about issues of overcrowding? Because we have heard very often that there are two, three, sometimes four times the amount of people who should be in a certain footprint. And Glenn from Hawaii Kai would like to know who makes the decision to decide how and when prisoners are released due to overcrowding and what plans are in place. Right, right are now. plans in place? Right now, um, um, there's no plans to release any inmates in the near future because of overcrowding. Um, but uh, that's always the possibility if the federal government looks at stepping in. Um, the director, there's a bill where the, the director wants to release um, um, those that have been sentenced to misdemeanors, um, uh, low risk, nonviolent, and pretrial. And he's got a bill that addresses about 300 inmates. Uh, but I've always been a strong advocate of um, electronic monitoring uh, with a, a GPS 24 7 device. And, putting more emphasis on rehabilitation and re-entry because that's where an inmate is within our uh, domain. And if we can stop that inmate from um, going back to a life of crime, that means you know, one less criminal in our system because right now the recidivism rate is about 50%. And, and, and you know, at one point it used to be 60, 70, we're trying to get it down to 30, 40. And if we could just reduce the recidivism rate, we can reduce the overpopulation and the prison population. Now, while we're talking about all of this, flipping it on its head for a second and looking at the other side, looking at HPD and issues of police reform, you've had several bills that are still moving right. in that direction, including the body cam bill. But in terms of creating an overall panel that would be it, you know, looking at issues of standards and being able to investigate properly. Some say that that's really missing, that there isn't any, you know, there aren't any teeth in any of this. 
Well, we have three bills that from the Senate that went to the House. Um, one has to do with body cameras and providing standards on um, body cameras in terms of the video and the film and, and making it standard across all counties because right now it's each county doing things individually. And we're hoping that that will move forward. Um, then there's two major, um, an independent review board in the case where an officer is involved in a, a, a shooting or a death in custody and um, serious bodily harm. And the third one would be the standards and training board. Uh, we're the only state in the nation that doesn't have the statewide uh, standards and training, what they call post professional, professional um, officer standards and training. And um, it's done at the county level. But uh, we have bills that are alive. We, we think those bills can still be amended. And, and we're trying to work with the law enforcement agencies as well. Um, because we're not only talking about county police, we're talking about state sheriffs, harbor police, airport police, conservation police, uh, Department of Taxation have police officers, the prosecutor have police officers. You may have heard about that gun that went off within the prosecutor's office. And, and so um, we're, we're hoping that statewide we could make some positive improvements. And now that's over on the House side and we'll wait and see what happens that's correct. with that want to move on here because one of the things that everyone is concerned about and not just in a, a year where we're going to be casting votes but looking at income tax uh, last year we watched those nine ten and eleven percent rates sunset and it looks like they're coming back yeah there at, at this point there is a bill alive um, uh, Senate bill 2454 I'm looking at uh, Willie's cheat sheet here, um, <laughs> that would retroactively bring those tax rates back. To what, January 1st? To January 1st of this year. So um, that, that uh, is supposed to be a revenue neutral bill. So I, I call it a Robin Hood bill. It basically takes from the rich and gives to the poor. Um, and uh, again, I, I think the, 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 te the technical problems would come in because it's retroactive. But uh, we uh, you know, looked at, at bills like that last year, and what we, what we said at that time was, OK, you, know, you guys in 2009 promised the taxpayers that this tax increase would be temporary. It would be five years, and that would be it. And, and, and taxpayers believed you. And so if you're, if you're going to uh, you know, do this kind of thing retroactive to the beginning of the year is, isn't, isn't that breaking the promise that maybe not you, but your predecessors may have made. And just to be clear, um, we're talking about uh, single individuals who are making uh, over $150,000 a year and couples, I believe it's either two hundred fifty dollars or $300,000 a year. Uh, and it, it's a lot about, you know, tax equity. Um, with this bill, um, many individuals, um, the lower income residents, uh, will um, not have a tax burden. And, and right now it's about um, 45 million um, um, from both ways, so 45 increase and 45 million um, less of a burden on the low income and poor. But there are, there are still going to be some costs associated with having to switch over and having it, it actually happen. It's not going to just simply be totally neutral. Well, there's, there's always cost involved, but um, I mean, that's the, you just have to do that if you're going to make these changes. Yeah, but even with the top tax rate of eight and a quarter percent that kicks in, I think, at 100,000 uh, or maybe less, uh, you're, you've, you've still got one of the top tax rates in the nation, like maybe you know, f uh, around number 15 or so. Uh, when we when we adopted nine, ten, and eleven, we we became number one, and uh, you know, California has since knocked us off the top spot. But that's that's really not in a place where you want to be. So, what would be a better way, if it were to accomplish the same things that those in the ledge are trying to by reinstating this? Well, uh, you really need to ask yourself, well, what's the money being spent for? Is it being spent efficiently? Is it being spent for things that we 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 really need to have as opposed to what we want to have? Uh, or some people want to have. You know, it's it's about priorities. You have to take the, you know, the scarce dollars that uh, that people have. Uh, you know, you're making them part with it, and 
uh, I think the uh, the job of state government is gen in, in general is to you know make wise use of those funds to to, to get them you know, deployed efficiently and uh, and to you know do you know good work. Well, to but common criticism everybody. comes across as well. You know the state isn't spending my money well, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and, and you hear hear a lot of that. And certainly you get that too when you're down to the legislature looking at how you're going to spend taxpayer dollars. And looking at how it's going to be, you know, looking at what just came over now from the House to the Senate, does it look like we're going to have a year where we're going to run into deficit spending? Uh, this is going to be the year. You know, both the um, governor's financial plan and his budget requests uh, tell us that we're going to be deficit spending uh, this year and the next fiscal year. So 17, 18, I think we're going to be deficit spending. And fortunately, we're coming out of a increase, a record increase in our fund balances going back to 2013, 844 million, 2014, 664, uh, 2015, 828 million. These are, these are high level fund balances. When I chaired the finance committee, we had uh, about 500 million, 500 mil, you know, million dollars. We thought that was, that was a big budget back then. But let's not forget, during the Great Recession, 2008 to 2012, we barely skip skip by, you know. So I think uh, prudence dictates that we spend our money carefully, we budget appropriately, and we take a good, firm, clear, honest assessment of what we need, what we can what we can what we can pay for, and, and how do we how do we get the most bang for our buck? Real, real quick, I think what what uh, um, Chair Takuda is looking at is is, is to, to be a little more progressive. Who can carry a, a, a higher burden of the tax burden to pay for our essential services that we all want? And I think that's why she's pursuing this. I don't know about the regressivity, I mean, retroactivity. I think that's problematic. But the general notions, I, I think, is a fair one. I think it's a legitimate one. As far as who can best bear the additional costs uh, in, in our society. Okay, one, one more thing to ask you about, though, is that when we talk to Carl Bonham at the UH Economic Research Organization, one of the things he's been saying consistently is, hey, folks, this may be as good as it gets this year and last year. And at some point, we're going to be looking at another recession. How much are you concerned about that as you're looking at possible deficit spending this year and what may happen as we go forward? I think Carl is right on. I think if you look at what's going on in the stock market, I think you're going at the price of oil right now. You look at what's going on in Europe. You look at what's going on in Japan. You look at, uh, you know, zero uh, interest on, on, on these monetary funds. Something is going on out there. And I think the, 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 the caution approach, uh, you know, is the better approach to be more prudent and, and watch these trends right now. Um, every seven years, on average, uh, the economy goes into a cycle of a recession or something close to that, uh, definitely a marketplace disruption. And there are signs out there right now, Beth Ann, uh, that signaling that we might face something like that come, come fall or early part of next year. Well, we're going to have to go in just a moment, but Senator Willis Barrow, I want to have you answer that too. How concerned are you about deficit spending? Oh, we're always concerned about deficit spending. and about uh, the years that are coming forward in terms of um, the revenues and I said what our constituents request and demand. Especially when you're looking at, you know, we're now in our 56th, 57th year as a state since statehood. And, and a lot of our infrastructure um, built in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s, they're getting older. And, and much of them need to be repaired and or replaced. And so, like I said, the cost of a new prison alone would be $400 million. So uh, the last thing we want to do is raise taxes, uh, but then the last thing we want to do is also cut government services. And that's the delicate balance that we have in, in government and in the legislature every year. Tom, a small word from you about deficit spending as we look at this being potentially the, the one of the better years that we're going to see. One of the things that we also have to consider is um, that, that we are obligated uh, for, for billions and billions of dollars you know, for our um, state worker benefits. Unfunded liabilities. Unfunded liabilities. We have, we have tons and tons of those. Uh, numbers that are less than what we have now took down uh, a, a big city in Michigan. Uh, we really have to be careful about, 
about what we do and, and you know how many demands we think we can answer because we have to be realistic when we look at this. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Good to be able to talk to you. We're going to see what happens as we go into the second half. Certainly, we weren't able to get to all of the questions that people gave us tonight, although many, many of them, I must tell you that we didn't get to, had to do with homelessness and people saying, you know, you guys really need to look more deeply into the issue of homelessness. A couple of people thinking it was a, a little bit, you know, clueless at this point, but we know that this is an ongoing conversation and we hope that we're going to be able to have more of them with you and with others. So thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your time. And now before we go, we want to let you know that members of the House Majority Leadership Team, including Speaker Joe Suki, declined to appear. Next time on Insights, we ask, what's it like to age out of Hawaii's foster care system at 18? You'll hear from former foster children, and we'll talk about a new program that extends foster care. What do Hawaii's foster youth need to transition into a successful adulthood? Thanks to PBS Hawaii for letting a colleague from Hawaii Public Radio sit in tonight. I'm Beth Ann Kozlovich. Aloha.